I'd say that no, if you're a lesser known region, you need to give people a reason to pay attention to you. Um, I think we saw this most notably with like Spanish, Portuguese, and like some of like Southern Italian wines. They did not enter the market at peak pricing or pre premium pricing. They kind of snuck in and showed why you should pay attention to them. And to do that in a economy where there's thousands upon thousands of other competitors, you have to give people a reason to pay attention to you first. Uh, hello, attendees. You know, everyone attending here from different parts of the world, mainly U.S., because we really wanted to uh, push this, uh, you know, uh, to more U.S. wineries and uh, more importers, you know, who would be uh, really more connected with you guys, you know, on how the U.S. market works. <clears throat> cool. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining me uh, on a short notice, you know, to all of you. Appreciate you jumping in. Uh, let's start with a quick introduction. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, I, you know, Paul uh, and uh, I guess. Sure. So hello everyone, I'm Paul Carayas. Uh, currently I just took a new position with Saison Hospitality up in San Francisco, uh, where I'm gonna be running uh, the new Saison wine bars and then also the private lounges. I also happen to be in the industry for over 26 years, certified Madeira wine educator for all North America, a sherry specialist, um, and love everything about food and wine. Wonderful, Paul, good to see you. Hi, I'm Thomas Brenner. Um, I am a wine buyer and sommelier and currently uh, run the beverage programs at a private golf and country club in the San Francisco Bay Peninsula. Natalie, you want to go? Hi, I'm Natalie Matthews. I'm a former sommelier, now on to the distribution side of wine with Breakthrough Beverage. Um, I'm a part of their Aztec Fine Wine Division as a fine wine specialist. And I've been in the um, industry or industry adjacent for the last 20 years, spanning two coasts. I moved here from Washington, D.C. in 2019 and have been here in the San Francisco Bay Area ever since. Great. Uh, Chris? Hi there. Uh, my name is Chris Horn. I'm the director of liquids for the Heavy Restaurant Group up here in Seattle. Uh, we have eight locations, including uh, two uh, wine bars. Uh, I've been in this business for longer than I want to say because I'm denying how old <laughs> I am. Um, but I'm happy to be here. Great. Ron? Hi, Ron Walter. Um, I am the group wine director at Knightsbridge Restaurant Group in <laughs> D.C. Uh, we have 12 restaurants. Uh, originally started in Manhattan, ran a retailer in New York, wine program in Chicago, and later uh, ran a wine importing distributing company in Chicago. Right. Super. So, uh, folks, you know, uh, we have a great mix here, and these are all real commercial uh, people, business people, right? So they, they have to take care of the P&L, uh, and I'm sure, you know, that's something uh, which is very important to understand as a supplier. So uh, let's go right into it. We have, you know, a group restaurant buyers. We have some high-end, uh, you know, uh, Michelin star restaurant buyers as well, and we have Country Club. Uh, Thomas is there. So, you know, that's a good mix uh, that we have here to get different perspectives. So I'll go right into the questions. Right. So first one, uh, lucky you, Thomas, curious to hear different ways to grow uh, sales once the account, uh, once the wine is placed in the account. Right. So you got the order, you're in, you're in the menu. Uh, what are different ways uh, oh, you can work with a supplier to grow your, you know, uh, to, so that they can grow their sales? That's a great question. Well, there are a great many ways to do this. There are different sales vehicles. There could be uh, several different featurettes. Uh, such as um, newsletters, uh, mailers, signage on the easel, uh, out front on display screens, um, on table tents, uh, on top of the bar top and proper dining tables, uh, sommelier spotlights, a happy hour if that's what you're into, uh, different type of promotions, uh, on-premise support from reps uh, from the distributors or um, talents from the winery themselves, talk about the product, uh, different events such as um, wine walks and winemaker dinners and immersive master classes, what have you not. But basically, uh, I think the new trend caters to immersive and exclusive and participatory experiences where there is a hands-on approach where the product sets you apart mm -hmm. from the herd 
And it's basically stories that sell and also the energy uh, and the personal touches to promote this endeavor, in my opinion. And at what point uh, you, you think suppliers uh, should ask you that question? Uh, maybe maybe once 50 percent of the depletion is done or if it's very slow, you know, what what time do you think they, they can ask you? All right. Like, what can we do more? Well, there's never a wrong time, I think. OK. If, if there is, um, if you see uh, an accelerated burst of uh, running through the product, then it's good to maintain that relationship too. Uh, people do get bored uh, a little bit and you also don't want to see that fall by the wayside. I think a lot of people become complacent uh, and that um, kind of breeds consternation and stagnation, really. Uh, we're always on to the next thing and I think there's uh, always support that is needed, um, especially pricing, so on and so forth. Um, uh, but also when the sales are lackluster, I think there is a, a a push or a good shove that is needed. So I think it's always very important once a product is placed to maintain uh, the energy and also the relationship with the buyer and the consumers that he or she represent. So next one is for Paul uh, from Bob Ryers from Kugini Winery. What influences on-premise buying decisions? I'm sure uh, that there is a big list, but maybe if there were top five things that you would consider that influences, uh, you know, your buying decisions for a new product. Uh, so there are a number of factors uh, that influence uh, on-premise wine buying. First, I would say that it's the market that you're in. Most importantly, what's those demographics? What are the people drawn to wine-wise? What do they already have in their cellar? Are they adventurous? Um, you know, what is the price point that they're willing to pay? Uh, will the wine complement the food that is being served, which I think is also very important? And is this placement for BTG, for buying the glass, or are you looking to place this on the bottle list? These and all, you know, these and more um, really help influence what on-premise buying decisions are all about. Also, it's also that we're all about building relationships and ones that should last a long time, if not a lifetime. So I know that relationships that I have with certain wineries, uh, winemakers, reps, distributors uh, have helped to shape my buying as to who I am. And I'm constantly trying to learn, always trying to push mm -hmm. myself. But at the end of the day, it's your customers, your market, that'll determine the types of wines that I think you carry. Brandon, uh, how much does a wine label affect your you know, decision choosing a wine for the table? Within the restaurant context, the wine label is less important than off-premise would be. Um, certainly, it can't. I've seen some labels that were honestly uh, a little on the offensive side, or at least I think some of our clients would find them so. Uh, but far less important on premise. It's what's in the bottle that's more important that it ha and that it has a story and that obviously price to value ratio uh, is is in order and those are more important. But on premise, the label is far less important unless it's something. I think I think uh, you want that means you want a neutral label, right? You don't want anything that can go either way as well, right? It really depends on what the overlap is. Um, I'm always concerned, especially given the number of restaurants we have, that the off-premise presence of the wine, it can't be so prolific as to cause problems at, on the restaurant level. Uh, if I go to Whole Foods or what have you and I see end caps filled with a wine that's being proposed to us, that could be problematic, obviously. Uh, but as for the aesthetic of the label, of the label, provided it is tasteful and not, not too divisive, it really is not a major factor in how we do purchasing. Okay, so is that uh, for uh, all of you mostly? Like, is, does everyone agree with uh, this that wine label is not so important for on premise? If I might jump in, I think that when you have different concepts that sometimes certain concepts uh the label can vibe better uh we have some uh some more fun loving uh casual spots and i think those those labels fit whereas the sort of classic chateau blah 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 label doesn't look quite right so i think it, it is a question of knowing who you're selling to and what uh what their uh what their vibe is 
Paul, one more uh, for you. I'm, uh, we'll come to you, Natalie and Chris. Uh, small wineries have a much bigger challenge. So this question is uh, pretty much for all, okay? Because I think this is the current state of our industry. So small wineries have a bigger challenge. I've just pasted it uh, from the supplier, so I'll, I'll say it, you know, uh, so you can pay attention to my words. So small wineries have a tension to enter uh, and get distributors because of the bottleneck, right? So is there a way they can approach you directly and use alternate models like LibDib or, you know, other models like MSW Park Street or, you know, even uh, private label or whichever way, like, are you entertaining this or you still prefer to work with a distributor? So everyone can sort of give their take on uh, this. And how can uh, small suppliers sort of, if they just can't, if they're not just getting distributors, how can they just start doing business with you? If there are any other suggestions. Sure. So, I mean, obviously I have, you know, great relationships with my distributors um, and those are you know, relationships that have been fostered over a very, very long time, but I'm always open to, and I do work with plenty of, you know, smaller uh, portfolios and then also small uh, wineries, you know, direct to, direct to me uh, in a sense or direct to consumer in that sort of sense, that sort of model. Um, and I think, again, it's just, it's just building those relationships, having a solid product and then one that works within your marketplace. Um, I'm always open to those things. And it is one of those that, I mean, if we sit down and, and, and um, I've never used LibDib before, but I mean, essentially I'm always open to those things. So as long as the communication is there, as long as the product is there, um, I, th I think that's just honestly the best way to just showcase yourself, you know, is your product just speak for itself. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that does uh, on your, in your case, but what, what about other, other, uh, all of you? Um, if you well, don't mind, I'd like to just chime in and say that in California where uh, Natalie, Paul and I reside, it's a little bit difficult as um, our state forces out of state wineries to go through a distributor. There's no way around it, which is very limiting. Whereas in state, wineries do not need to go through a distributor. They can do that um, at their own behest. So that's a really interesting fact to consider. So for out-of-state wineries to see product placement here, um, they do need to go through someone like Natalie from Breakthrough. Uh, I personally don't care where it comes from. If it's good juice, I don't care who sells it. Um, I've gone uh, through LibDib before too, but I just think that uh, having a good presence and a personal touch uh, matters as there are thousands of brands that have great juice and I think that there's a lot of uh, nepotism and personal relationships that we do forge with our reps the distributors and portfolios so that we can get better product uh, placement well so uh, if I can well add said. into that yeah if I can add into that uh, I ran a distributor for 15 years and I don't think there was a week that we ever had that we didn't get solicited by at least 30 new wineries uh, so it's there's as we all know, there's a ton of wineries out there. LibDib right now, memory serves is in 15 states. Uh, so that leaves a considerable amount of the country that does not have that kind of coverage. The other issue, of course, um, is some states do allow direct shipments to restaurants. So in the District of Columbia, for example, you can do that. There's a limit to how much wine you can get. But the issue then becomes one of logistics, because if you need to replace product that is selling quickly, it may take time to get a shipment from the winery process and then send to a restaurant directly. Um, it's a perpetual problem because there are so many wineries in the world and there's never there never seems to be enough distributors or time for wine directors and sommeliers to actually vet all of the times that were approached by those entities. So th there is a bit of an issue. Some of it is honestly contingent on the winery to try to do market work and entice buyers and educate them on them and then try to get them to solicit their distributors to bring on a product that they can commit to. Uh, but it, it is complicated just because the number of wineries that are out there and the limitations that distributors have. True. Uh, Natalie and then uh, Chris, uh, your take on this? Okay, so I have a bit of a different take on this, and that's coming from straddle both sides of the coin. Um, I think that some of the best approaches that especially smaller wineries could have is knowing the distributor that you are seeking to work with. Do they have a fine wine team? If they do, then there's a greater chance of visibility and um, product development within the market that can happen on a um, smaller level, whether 
um, that be, you know, doing market blitzes with the winery or um, the reps, the individual reps themselves taking it upon themselves to be so inspired by your product that they go out and do the Lord's good work. Or also um, the integration of AI, which my company is undergoing right now. And it's very similar in a lot of ways to what I've seen with Libden. Um, and I think that that's probably the next wave that you're going to see a lot of distributors, especially the larger ones, move towards. Interesting. So they are going to offer uh, clearance services. Is that where you're going? It's more so on-demand services, not necessarily okay. on-demand delivery. But I'm thinking back on my days when I was wine buying, what are the main times of which I'm formulating my orders and wanting to submit them? But I know it's too late for my rep to receive a text or an email. It's generally between the hours of like 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. So if you have this interface that you can always interact with, you can see product tech sheets, pricing in real time, availability in real time, which it seems like LibDib does. If you can see that, especially amongst larger distributors, <clears throat> it can make all of the difference with um, your market visibility, support, um, capacity to see the needs and the trends in markets in real time, um, instead of waiting for that information and those metrics to filter through quarterly or you know monthly, Understood. if that's you know the, the the goal cycle that your distributor is on, um, and then for like smaller. Um, distributors or importer distributors. Um, I always think that they already have the natural component of um, human touch that, you know, AI doesn't necessarily have to um, be so, um, doesn't necessarily have to become a part of because their portfolios tend to be a little bit smaller. But even if their portfolio isn't that small, because there are a couple of like smaller importer distributors that do still have sizable books. Mm -hmm. um, I think the incorporation of the use of AI could be beneficial just for all sides of the point. Uh, Chris? I think that this might sound simplistic, but uh, it's just what's coming out in my brain. Uh, often these days, that wine is personal and we like to buy it from people. And I think that, at least in the state of Washington, we're lucky that we have so many small wineries where their business model is to self-distribute and you get to hand the check to the person that made the wine. Um, and because of that, it, there is a stark contrast when you're getting a pitch that feels canned or it, when it feels like marketing, but not great marketing, um, where it's not as much information, but um, a, a misunderstanding of who they're selling to. So I, I think that anytime people can make it feel like they're speaking directly to me as an operator of many restaurants, that that is the foot in the door. Um, that's just me, and I think that's the that's the difficulty. Is there's a lot of different versions of me out there, and everybody might have a different uh, a, a different. Uh, uh, point of entry i think i'm i'm summarizing this as a, as a takeaway i think yes you're open as long as you know you can fulfill what distributors do which is service delivery order guarantee merchandising support see you again and again every two weeks right so that's what i'm summarizing and then comes uh, uh people like chris who who want to meet the makers of the world and who don't mind but there is a minimum uh size of the business that you have to do because he can afford to do that. So maybe, you know, maybe a small one restaurant cannot. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, I'm still listening. I'm just I'm giving my take understanding here where you're, I think I'm listening in this way that it's still a good uh, hard work initially get the distributor, but through distributor, it's much better I'll win eventually because uh, I think you are opening every door that way. You know, this way uh, you are limiting yourself uh you know, going direct. Ultimately, it's not a scalable model still, I think, right? So uh, how do you create value in local wine within your restaurant? Uh, Shamai from Bakel Family Wines, right? So this is for Renan. This is a tough one. Um, they are based, um, if I remember correctly, out of Colorado. Um, you have emerging wine growing areas, which always are wonderful, but also create new 
new headaches for the wineries um, and getting the word out there and marketing is always a complicated thing. Um, part of it, what we do at a lot of our restaurants, and we obviously have Virginia, which has been making wine for a long time, but is in many parts of the country not very well known. Uh, for, so, for some of our restaurants, we do um, text boxes on menus, which will highlight uh, a region or a specific winery. Uh, we also maybe do may do a sommelier selection to help to uh, spread the gospel about that area or that winery specifically. We've also done uh, tasting series through several wineries from an area, uh, but a lot of it is interactive. Um, getting the winemakers or representative of the winery um, to do either tastings, which we can do at our wine bar. Um, or other types of outreach uh, work very well, especially if you're a smaller winery trying to get into a new market. Uh, and as we talked about earlier in this conversation, it's the interaction uh, and it's people feeling special and having a special moment or interaction with a local winery is what's going to ultimately build uh, build that relationship and those brands. Uh, an old a uh, mentor of mine used to always say that brands are built on premise. It's that relationship. It's the time you're spending with the bottle at the table and enjoying it with your friends um, is, is a great thing. Um, so that's that's usually how we proceed when we're trying to work with smaller wineries or wineries from emerging areas. Uh, and their interaction is, I, I can't overstate how important it is that they be interactive within new markets, uh, especially in their neighborhood. Nestle, uh Again, a, a simple question, maybe everyone can, uh, I'm sure everyone will have a different answer. Uh, but just as a, by experience, forget about your own restaurant, let's say by experience, everyone can chip in. What is a good, uh, you know, uh, range, like two, three dollar range uh, for the volume, you know, uh, when it comes to an average restaurant in America, let's say, you know, what, what price bottle sells best on premise? Are you talking about... Um... <laughs> I know that's there's, there's so I, I actually I understand. So maybe I'll, <laughs> let, let's give someone some value. So let's say uh, if I was uh, making uh, you know uh, Pinot Noir from Oregon, we'll pick three. You know, and uh, what 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 is a target price that uh, I, I should sell to you? Let's say you know which which is a good price. Mm, depends on what part of the country you're in. I mean Pinot Noir from Oregon. Uh, but, no, a part of the country the sales are being made in because what I've noticed working on two different coasts that couldn't be more different from each other is what I can get away we'll, with we'll here. Pick, in, we'll pick Chicago, all right, guys, for, for everyone. Chicago, <laughs> in the middle. Okay. Um, well, Pinot Noir, if um, you have an experienced buyer, just in general, I would say, um, they know that it's one of the most expensive and tenuous grapes to cultivate. Um, um, so that price point, um, I would say anywhere between a wholesale price of like 20 to okay. 35 would be a sweet spot because uh, okay. you have to think about where the it would land on a restaurant wine list and what the consumer would be most willing to buy. And, okay. um, you know, our sales, I, I've so seen it. Let me like, twist it in a different way, maybe just for something popped up. Like, is there any place where you reference check a price or? Or just by experience, you would know that, okay, from the Lamento Valley, Pinot Noir should cost you this much. And then obviously it depends on the taste, how good it is and vintage and all that. Or is there a little reference, you know, uh, book that you still refer to those thick books, you know, which we had or 750 or any place where you go to just do quick price check? I think for a buyer, um, it's just like product and market knowledge and okay. the trends being within their own sales categories. But for the consumer, uh, I see a lot of people using this little app for Vivino or Wine Searcher mm -hmm. that really wreck a program um, mm -hmm. and skew opinions and uh, force new trends to emerge and uh, has just a very direct correlation with pricing. Here's, uh, we got some more details. What is the price point for lesser known region wines on by the glass list, uh, for example, specifically saying about Eastern Europe, you know, uh, should we be promoting higher quality or entry level? How is the region perceived uh, still in, in higher end restaurants? 
I mean, in, in medium to high end restaurants? So I'd say because um, it is a lesser known region and we've seen this problem, especially post pandemic with a lot of regions seeing Napa being the benchmark and preeminent, uh, I mean, Okay. Premier regions in France being able to charge absolute premium prices. Then you have the lesser known, smaller guys who haven't had quite the same economic success thinking, oh, I can inflate and do this too. Um, and then um, pricing and uh, shipping and importing saw a, a price hike surge too. So I get that there's multiple facets that would influence this answer. But um, I'd say that, no, if you're a lesser known region, you need to give people a reason to pay attention to you. Um, I mm -hmm. think we saw this most notably with like Spanish, Portuguese, and like some of like Southern Italian wines. They did not enter the market at peak pricing or pre premium pricing. They kind of snuck in and showed why you should pay attention to them and to do that in a economy where there's thousands upon thousands of other competitors, you have to give people a reason to pay attention to you first. Mm -hmm. And it, um, you break down that access barrier by being at a lower price point, especially as millennials are starting to step forward um, with uh, influencing buying trends. You know, you have to also... You, you have to be aware of. I think that's a very good point. You said like a, a young consumer or a new adventure consumer is going to try that category and they need a, a good reason, a less friction to try the category, you know, which is a yeah. price is the main, main friction. Pricing that millennials look for is different from uh, yeah. Gen X. And well, we don't really consider Gen X, but um uh, baby boomers. So it's, you have to factor in, you, you can't leave those stones unturned when you're factoring in pricing. All right, Thomas, uh, Chris from Bartera Winery is asking, with alcohol consumption generally in a decline, is it good idea uh, to focus the resources on retaining the consumers? Or, you know, it, you think it's still okay to sort of cold call and have new accounts opened approach. And we're talking about limited resources, right? So obviously you have two reps and you have limited money. Let's say, do you want to just have those reps focus on the current business? Or maybe, you know, you think still, you know, it's a good idea to, you know, uh, it's like protect the territory or still go for the new new territory. What's what's your take uh, on, on this, Thomas? Not to sound like a, a Bond villain, but I would want the world mm -hmm. if I was, you know, myself or anyone. Um, it's very important to attract new customers and also maintain the relationships and augment them uh, with the ones that are pre-existent. Um, I saw an article recently that um, explained why there is a worldwide decline in even traditional wine consuming countries. And it is social media because uh, the youngsters don't want to get caught being drunk and um, legalized marijuana, actually. Um, I know this is a very Californian perspective, but there have been a lot of studies and these uh, are areas of primary focus as to why there is a decline and people are, are drinking, you know, pre-batched cocktails and can format and uh, hard seltzers. Mommy's little helper used to be a quaalude, uh, but nowadays it's just a good, you know, um, people uh, do the same at parties uh, and they don't want to be caught drinking on social media. It's, uh, it's forever. So you got to think about uh, how people think like that. And Therefore, it's very important to maintain the relationship with the old guard and think about the new guard. Um, I read that the Chinese market is the only one in the entire world where youngsters are enthused by wine anymore and will go really deep and spend a lot of money on wine. And that the Indian market is supremely emerging and that in a decade it'll double. So it'd be really wise to think about um, new well, markets. The new, new wine drinker is basically, yeah. Yes, ex exactly. You got to um, you, you got to kind of reinvent the wheel a little bit and be smart about that, but then also uh, focus on the true adherence and potential brand ambassadors that are already in your corner. Morgan's not here, but I'm going to ask this question to maybe Chris. Uh, there is a surge in quality and availability in Balkan wine, Croatia in particular. How can sommeliers leverage this to drive more consumers to restaurants for the wine as much as the food? Well, I think 
context has a lot to do with our perception of flavor and some wines when you're evaluating them on their own might not have uh, the resonance that they do once they're with the right solid food um we have uh, a lot of uh a long track record of taking wines that are a little bit outside the margins and and showcasing them with the, the right in the right context and um you know uh, you can you can sell a uh, georgian kinsmerly saparavi if it's with the right food on its own it's a little bit harder especially in this sort of post-pandemic hangover where people are still gravitating toward comfort wines uh where they feel a little bit of control and they're avoiding any possible uh disappointment um that uh i, I think it's it's vitally important to give those things context and also tell the story of them uh we we consume the story as much as we consume the liquid so uh if the if the message and the story is sound and and true so let's be true um I think that's how those wines can get in front of the consumer. And you know how it is. It's like when you, when you're the first person to hear a band and you're like, Oh, this is my band. And then, you know, people get on the bandwagon later. You're like, well, I was there first. I think there is a little bit of that one to get there first. Uh, when it comes to those wines that are a little bit outside of the current mainstream. So I think, uh, I, I personally am always seeking out the new stuff. Uh, it's not, because I'm bored, it's because uh, I need to create excitement in my staff and in in the consumer. All right, this one is good for everyone, right? So, what are your consumers asking? You know, what kind of uh, let's let's say, what are the three things that you are bullish on uh, that you are looking to buy next? You know, uh, can be a region, variety, price point. So, just throw your three uh, that you are actually looking for and expect uh, growth in the next six months. Please, everyone can answer this. Sadly. Uh, the wine consuming uh, populace at large just want big and red, but there's also a sense of seasonality. Uh, I think right now in the uptick of the old temperature gauge, we'll see a little bit more um, acidic, white, uh, rosé wines, hopefully sparkling wines, lighter reds. Um, so it's kind of interesting, but I think a lot of people have been duped uh, by the machinery into thinking that everything has to be big and red and bold and oaky and tannin -rific. So that's what consumers are asking for. I'm turning that around, I believe, and doing a good job, but it really does take, um, it does take us passionate wine professionals to teach our adherents about different things. And just like Chris said, you know, um, we're always looking for the next thing, not necessarily because we're bored. We got to keep people excited and um, everything comes in, in fads and, and, People are very susceptible to suggestions, so let's let's turn that around. Unless you know, of course, that's what you're into. Each their own. Paul. Um, well, I mean, kind of to piggyback off that, <clears throat> what, what, what Thomas was saying is that you know, I also hear winemakers say this is like you know, you get your house palate, um, if you will. So if you're always drinking the same wines or you're drinking your own wines all the time, uh, you usually tend to uh, not get the experience that you would when you venture out into, into tasting other things. So I think again, you have to adhere to what your obviously your customers are going to be buying, but you know, this is a chance for us to educate. <clears throat> this is for us, a chance for us to go ahead and, and, and give them something exciting and new. Um, you know, again, like, you know, we're getting into the season, as Thomas was saying, of, you know, the, the high acidic whites, the rosés and all that. It's like, give them some nice, you know, a chillable red, something that's crushable, something that can be eaten along with seafood and things of that nature, getting into that market as well. But again, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the fear of the unknown. And once it becomes you know, known, and then it's not fearful anymore. And that really opens up the, the floodgates of here, let me show you all these things. And that's how we, as sommeliers and as wine buyers and the rest of it, that's how we become trusted advisors to our guests. As we show them this segue, we show them these beautiful other products that there are to get them out of their norm, to show them adventures. And again, at the end of the day, I did this during the pandemic where it's like, we can't always travel. Travel is expensive. But what we can do is travel in our glass and we can take ourselves to another region, another area, transport ourselves to those areas, you know, give the context of the story, you know, sell the sizzle, not the steak. Uh, at the end of the day, though, the product is going to sell itself um, if it's something good and high quality. So let's go a little specific, uh, 
you know, here and uh, all of you can just say, like, 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 if there is any particular three or four things that are popping up, like, do you think Croatian wines or Georgian Eastern Europe? And I've been hearing this a lot in UK, uh, especially where it's coming back. Those regions are popping Georgia, Croatia, let's say uh, non-alcoholic wines for sure. Right. So are people asking uh, yet or are you still hand selling them uh, this kind of things? I'll take that off if that's OK with everybody. Is that yeah. I was just in Georgia um, last year. Uh, and I know the perception of Georgian wines has been that, you know, sometimes the quality level is not as consistent. Uh, but being there and being that they've been listening to a lot of the um, uh, mentors, if you will, of people have been getting more sanitation, they're going to you know school, they're going to Davis, the rest of the stuff and bringing back these practices, still working with their queries and, and the rest of the things in their amphora wines. Um, but it is a topic. Uh, that is also getting a lot more press. So again, you're getting a lot more buzz, which therefore also and people are getting excited about, ooh, what's this exotic product? The problem is that it has to stay consistent. And if it's not staying consistent, therefore things or perceptions will change. You may get, you know, you may reel somebody in, in a sense, uh, to like a product. And then the next year or a year down the road, the product isn't sound anymore. It's changed, um, you know, or I've heard of winemakers changing their, their recipe, if you will, for the American market, because they feel that's what the Americans are going to drink. The problem is that them. people have had that wine, whether it's in Georgia or another country, and then you change the recipe and they're like, well, that's not the same thing that I had. So it's, mm. it's a fine line, um, but at the end of the day, again, it's just getting that buzz. Uh, and it loses Chris, its authenticity yeah. when they do that as well. So yeah. uh, Chris exactly. and Ryan, you may have a little larger chunk of data because of the group of restaurants. So what, what are the three or four things that you see uh, people are actually asking on the floor? I was going to say begrudgingly, uh, uh, people are still asking for some there, which is d disturbing and distressing. But we've been trying to obviously stretch people and get them out of there. So we are... Not that I have anything against Sancerre, but we are going Sancerre adjacent. So Manitou Salon has been doing very well for us. Uh, can see uh, things that are a little bit different, but still in the wheelhouse. Uh, obviously, it's summertime coming to D.C., and it is incredibly humid here. So uh, we're definitely in rosé season. Uh, Crew Beaujolais are selling very well right now. Uh, and we are doing quite well with lesser known Spanish areas outside of some of the mainstream. But that, that, that's more or less what's, what's going on here. The big chunky wines are not as popular in, in this market, at least, as they were. Uh, and that, that's just, just a, a change in, uh, in palate, at least for now. Yeah, I, I think I want to uh, echo the, the thing about Gamay Noir. I think that what's happened with uh, Pinot Noir, with Burgundy, uh, it's, it's pricing out a lot of people and we're finding that, oh, hey, mm -hmm. Cru Beaujolais is half or a third or a quarter of the price and you're getting the same sort of experience. But more specifically, uh, some trends that, that, that we're seeing, uh, sparkling red wines. I sold more Lambrusco and local sparkling red wines in the last 12 months than I did maybe prior 12 years. Are, are you selling um, sweeter Lambruscos or drier ones? No, no, they're, they're dry. They're, they're okay. dramatic and they're, they're, they're great when you're just sitting around eating charcuterie yep. uh, or a pizza for that for that matter we're seeing a uh, uptick in grenache uh again grenache is uh when it can be made as we know many different styles but the, the style that we're seeing people interested in is that sort of pinot noir adjacent style that lighter more red fruited more acidic more uh energetic style of grenache and i want to say rosé but i want to say more skin contact wines and um and we could talk about the natural wine movement we want to but i think that that winemakers are playing around more with longer uh contact pinot grigios uh, uh long contact bruson and and or riesling diversimir and and these wines are compelling and they work because they have an entry point like the consumer knows about pinot grigio but do they know about romano pinot grigio a lot don't and uh and those those stories are really easy to tell, really quick to tell, and the the enjoyment is immediate because it's not so outside of what has been known or experienced in the past. Uh, I think maybe uh, you see uh, you would also have a great data because you are such a big wholesaler uh, right now on the other side of the business. Uh, so let me ask you: What are the three uh, fastest growing region or? SKU types uh, that you saw in the last 30 days in your uh, breakthrough? For on premise, it's different than um, independent retail, but with independent retail, they've all asked for collectively orange wines, Loire, wines from the Loire, 
and um, wines from um, islands. So think like um, Sardinia, Sicily, Canary Islands, um, because um, this is where this is where people are starting to travel a lot more now. It's like there's been an unleash of unleashing of the wild um, and into the wild uh, since the pandemic and it restricted a lot of travel and um, like right now it's been pretty slow in San Francisco. Um, everyone is having a very slow um, selling season and um, lower um, cover counts than general on both retail and on premise from what I'm seeing. Um, and a lot of it's because it's traveling. Like most of my company, we're, we're about to leave the country again. Like everybody's traveling right now. So, um, but this is where a lot of people are going. So where people are traveling, they come back and then they're seeking those wines. Oh, I have this really good wine and blah, blah, blah. Such That's a place. So cool, and, yeah. yeah I've, and I've seen, I saw that in DC too. Good data to track, you know, where are Americans traveling more in 2024 and then uh, <laughs> sort of bring those regions back, right? Cool. Uh, uh, Paul, do you charge? I, I think, I mean, this this can be a very straight up answer if you don't have to. I understand the legal part of things. So, uh, you know, obviously, but in different ways. So let's say, is there a slot fee or do you charge wineries if, if they say that I'll take care of your menu or I'll, I'll do this and that, you know, or you all just prefer, you know, this, uh, does this still happen or is... What's your take there? Personally, I've uh, I've never been I've never charged a winery for placements. Um, I've heard of that through the grapevine, uh -huh. uh, but I've never experienced it myself. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, I think the product should should speak for itself. I'm not sure about other people, but I've never experienced that. Yep. Oh, I, I, I just want to chime in. No, it's unethical uh, to charge wineries, but um, depending on who I work for, if it's a, it's a, we'll we'll do placements if they buy us new menus and uh, check presenters uh, and all that stuff. So I've I've done that uh, a couple of times. Um, you know, it's it's self serving. We we save thousands of dollars of um, getting new menus and different different support and then they will get the placement so there is kind of a tit for tat kind of thing um you know so let, let, let's compare three, three or four ticks of tax like is, do you think that if i say you know give me your lowest performing sku and i'll pick up all that stuff and i'll 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 make up for that loss uh you put my wines there does that happen kind of i, I think so there's there's always objectives that um sellers are chasing so I'll, I'll, I'll say sometimes hey what are you chasing right now to help them out uh but most of the time I'll go for stuff that actually will sell and I'll get, you know, 10 free cases of uh, stemware, like really nice glasses, too. So I, I will do that. Not to point out any names, but certain yeah. sellers and their companies that might or might not be present here have some really enticing things where you get uh, 10 cases of uh, Brand X and then get, uh, you know, 10 cases of Schutzwiesel glasses, Congresso 30s, maybe. And uh, a person like me would say, yeah. You have to get creative. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the thing. You got to get creative. <laughs> Good answer. For a smaller brand, uh, how do you stand out? I'm sure this is a big question, but maybe if you can, if you were wearing their hat, right? If you were a small company and someone was talking to a guy like you, you know, what would that uh, presentation look like? I think that the, the biggest mistake that uh, I've seen in the last 25 years of buying wine for restaurants is that people try to sell me wine before they read my wine list before they look at my menu they understand that we're a busy restaurant in downtown or we're a busy restaurant in, in wine country um uh but they don't know who they're selling to um and so just a, like a little bit of research that cold call email to general manager at purplecafe.com that doesn't that doesn't reach me other mistakes people make is that they cold call personally uh come in without and then some have <laughs> more than once people will sit at the bar pull out their own wine and start pouring it to my guests which is crazy oh. making but it happens we're we're in a uh, it's, we have a thousand wineries in the state and it's hard uh and i and i appreciate how hard it is but sometimes the people that are trying to sell me wine don't know who the hell i am and that that's when that's the worst way to go but when it is effective um I want to tell you the name of the, the winery and the winemaker, but um, I there was a new, newer winery in the, in the state, and uh, I emailed them and said, "Hey, I'm interested to, to hear about your your pricing and availability." And the answer I got back is, "Oh, I'm having dinner in your restaurant right now. Uh, my wife works down the street, and we come in a couple of times a week." And so this winemaker never 
uh, bothered to identify themselves. Whereas most winemakers, it's almost like, you know, one of the first things out of their mouth, oh, I'm a winemaker, rather than being uh, somebody who's just in, in the restaurant as, as a customer. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question uh, broadly enough, these sound very, like very specific things, but I will kind of pivot back to that. Um, You're answering what not to do for sure. So now maybe yeah. three or four <laughs> things what you can do. What you can do is you can find out who the wine buyer is at the restaurant. And that that's it's a very short email. Like who's who's responsible for buying your wine? Not not the cut and paste of like, here's our winery story and we would be perfect for you. Um, then it's contacting the the wine buyer and and, and asking if there's uh it's an opportunity to present some wine. I think it's different for everybody. I don't love it when people just drop off stuff because I I will not get to it and it might just end up being handed to the staff on a Friday night because we're thirsty. Another way to do that is, and, and this is just, you know how we are as people, you know, friends of friends. Um, when when we have relationships with existing winemakers, a lot of times they'll be like, hey, my friend's making wine. You should talk to them. Um, or they'll say, hey, my friend's making wine. They'd like to talk to you. Um, th- those personal avenues are also pretty effective. And then we have uh, restaurants close proximity to over 100 winery tasting rooms. And sometimes we'll get invitations saying, hey, we'd love your staff to come in on this day. It's our industry day. Um, we, we'd love to see you from these hours. Please RSVP. And that's that's a personal invitation to see their hospitality and see how they treat people and and taste their uh, their wines in the context of how they're presenting themselves. And then it's it's being at trade tastings where you are you are presenting yourself uh, in a in a way that is hospitable. It, it's tough. Like uh, selling is a, a certain life energy that that uh, is not maybe intrinsic to some human beings. But yeah, it's uh, it's all those things. Um, I'm not sure if, if uh, I'm missing anything. Does anybody else in the panel have a Paul? Uh, you want to you want to go here on. What do you think a good process uh, can look like when it comes to introducing a product? Well, again, just to piggyback off that other stuff is, again, just first research the restaurant a little bit, research who is buying and research the list. Um, Because if not, it is kind of saying that you're out of touch uh, with those sorts of things. Also make sure that you're calling us or, you know, not during service hours or coming in or pouring your wine at those times. It's great when you stop by before service, Um, you know, call ahead of time, email ahead of time. I know it sounds cliche because you want to speak to somebody right away, but I mean, that really is, you know, the best way to get your foot in the door. Realize that we're super busy just like you and I don't want to waste your time and I don't need my time being wasted either. Um, But just be kind, you know, and and, then, you know, again, and be hospitable. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I know that I am. Persistence is definitely, definitely key. And when we do finally get to sit down, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like, bring it, bring your good wines. Um, when this is your time to wow me, like really, this is your chance. And, you know, if you don't, I mean, again, I'll give everybody the time of day once. And if, and if you don't, it's like, I'm sorry, I have to move on. I have a business to run. Uh, Ryan, you want to come in here as, as what you no, absolutely you echoing a lot of what everyone else <laughs> echoing a lot of what everyone else has been saying. Also, uh, trade events are a good way to do this. Uh, there are every state and every country has organizations that represent the wineries and are promoting the wines. Uh, a lot of them will do for buyers um, wineries that are looking for distribution or for, or, or, or to, uh, augment their business. This is a good way to interact, but also obviously do not walk in without an appointment. That's always a bad move. Um, but trying to connect, come in for a bite to eat, introduce yourself, leave samples or bottles or what have you, if, if you're able to, uh, but start the conversation. Um, it's everything is uh, in this, in this business, it's all about interaction and about, creating relationships. And especially if you're a smaller winery, you have to work, frankly, twice as hard to do it because there's so much competition out there. Uh, but it's all about relationships and about communication. But mm-hmm. cold calling just does not work ever. Cool. Uh, Natalie and then uh, maybe Thomas. Mm-hmm. I, I think you can also add, you know, how how does, did your life become easy being a sommelier selling to a sommelier? Do, do you think that's like 5x easier? Well, one of the best kept secrets is that... Um, you never really know your friends until you have to sell to them. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you know? so, uh, um, let's lead with that. Um, but then um, it doesn't. But at least you don't have you. You have an appointment, right? They don't even have that. 
Ooh. So I come from a market. I'm going to have to lay this one down a little bit more Um, because I've had a lot of conversations about this um, since switching over to this side. But I come from a market where the master songs used to at least ingrain in the older guard. Grace, be nice to your suppliers, be nice to anybody basically that you have to do business with because this is hospitality. So I try to lead from that standpoint. Um, As you can imagine, my market is very much predicated on who you know and power structures. Um, So what has been successful for me in getting brands into um, a lot of the accounts that I call on, but maybe they had deeper relationships with, you know, somebody else previously from that company or with a different company um, is the soft sale, the kind of silent tuck in your ego. Remember the hospitality aspect of what you're doing, you know, because I need the buyer to remember that I am doing essentially what you're doing just on a different side of the tier system. So one of the things that I have heard a lot from um, accounts that were kind of like pegged as difficult um, to penetrate within my company is just always showing up. I'm there. You, they know they're going to see my face um, at least once every seven to nine days. And if I can't get you, I've um, situated my day where I like to leave an open bottle because that forces you to drink it within a certain amount of time. <laughs> <That's> and, <good. laughs> Like if I really, really like you, I'll give you an unopened bottle because I can trust you. But see, like that trust goes both ways, right? And a lot of the time the buyer thinks that they're the only one, you know, that are controlling that dynamic. But it's it's sales happening on both sides. And, you know, I guess like the art of manipulation, really. Um, so I, my favorite thing to do is to get these... Um, I'm kind of becoming known for this, these little stickies, these post-its. I have my backups right here that are fully sticky. And I write what I want you to know. If I cannot meet you, stick it on the back of the bottle, put the the distributor's name on there. You know it's only going to be me. And I'll leave it for them at the bar. I will make the contact with somebody that, uh, you know, I probably already know in the staff and I've done a lot of orders that way. People will be like, Oh my God, I am so sorry. I missed you. I was really, really busy, but thank you for these notes. Like, and then they love that, you know, it's just kind of like the the soft creep in. I do think that a lot of what's missing on both sides is the hospitality aspect. And a lot of the time wineries don't necessarily have the um, luxury of having a former buyer on their team or somebody who used to work for a distributor and you just know knows a certain tips or tricks on how to be more elegant um, at the sale. But um, if they are showing up unannounced, which I have to do a lot because in SF, it's very easy for buyers to just ignore you. You can call, you can email, you can text all you want. It's not working. Just if you do show up, be silent. Maybe have stickers with your your business name on it. Like um, I like to do, like if I'm paying the bill and I haven't said an identifying word all night because I can already see the climate, they're busy. Now's not the time, but I kind of want to say, hey, I was here. I'll leave a stick it in my, my business card with the check. You know, so it gets the conversation going that, oh, you've been here quite a bit. Maybe um, I should try to see what you're about, see what you have. And then I get that one shot and I have to make sure that I'm, I'm, I make it worthwhile. Like I have a buyer who has a 160 page tome of a wine list. And um, I know that my uh, Northern California sales director had had a lot of conversations with me. Like, oh my God, he's probably like one of the most um, important buyers in the city and blah, blah, blah. And then he went with me to our first tasting and I could tell that he didn't, he didn't, um, want it to go wrong. Um, but I knew enough to look through that list and I knew almost everything that he had on that list just from looking at it. Mm -hmm. And that really perked him up. He was just like, 
you read my list. Yes, I did. Um, so he said to me just last week, I know that whatever you bring or whatever is in your bag, it's going to be worth my while. That's how you have sales.